A very controversial theory was debated tonight at the University of Western Ontario. The debate was between TV host and geneticist David Suzuki and Philip Rushton. Rushton is a professor whose most recent work has been denounced by some as racist. He says there is a relationship between racial background and intelligence, specifically that Orientals are more intelligent than whites and whites more intelligent than blacks. I have been persuaded by data and findings from numerous sources that the races do differ genetically. Rushton claimed there weren't only differences in intelligence, but in other areas as well. His claims must be denounced, his methodology de discredited, his grant revoked, and his position terminated at this university. This is not science. Criticism also came from the audience. My son, who is the only black boy, the only non-white in his class, his 10 years, he asked me just two nights ago, Daddy, does it mean that I am the dumbest person in my class just because of you? Outside the university auditorium, about 200 people protested the debate. They chanted that racism is not debatable. Although we're in 2022 now and Professor Rushton was quite a while ago, there is still that looming presence when you find out a university's past, making us feel uncomfortable on being ourselves and making us question our own intellectual capabilities here at this university. Although there have been actions done by Western and um, Black student alumni networks and Black students here at Western as a whole, there's still that looming presence of not being enough alongside systemic racism and everyday racism that Black students face here. From kindergarten to college and university, Black students are the victims of racially insensitive school policies and practices, which push them out of the education system and into the criminal justice system in Ontario. This is the School to Prison Pipeline. In 2020, Black Legal Action Centre, with funding from the Government of Canada, started a project to document the experiences of anti-Black racism in relation to the school-to-prison pipeline in Ontario. This initiative uh, focuses on the school-to-prison pipeline, uh, more so connecting directly with the Black community across Ontario. We are a federally funded project through the Anti-Racism Fund, and what we're really looking at is connecting with Black families, Black students across the province of Ontario to better understand their experiences within the classroom environment and to really look at some meaningful ways that we can create changes within the classroom and then within the justice system as well. We've connected with Peel, region. Um, we've connected with York, uh, Toronto, uh, Durham, Hamilton, Windsor, London, and Ottawa. And so what we wanted to look at was eight different regions across the province and to connect with families, connect with students there and say, you know, what are some of the positive things that are happening within the school environment? Um, what can we learn from each other around best practices and new ways of doing things? And of course, we also wanted to focus on what are some of the challenges, um, specifically around anti-Black racism and the experiences that are happening for our students within the classroom. There's a lot of um, information about the school to prison pipeline in places like the United States and the UK as opposed to um, Canada in general, even though the phenomenon was a really, really rich one. What really surprised me was the legacy and the history of anti-black racism starting from the era of slavery in Canada onto what we have today. Deidre McCorkendale is a PhD candidate who researches questions about the origins of scientific racism in Chatham, Ontario. In the 1930s, the late 1930s, there was an intelligence study that was conducted on the black children in the Kent County area. And it was performed by their superintendent of schools, and his name was H.A. Tanzer. This study argued that the children under his care um, as superintendent of schools 
faced no prejudice and it used their history of uh, being the descendants of the Underground Railroad and the activist community that was here to argue that their lower scores were somehow reflective of a biological impairment rather than a structural one that he was most certainly a part of. And while the test and his study, which was published into a book and was used um, as part of another study to argue against the Brown versus Board of Education decision, it's largely forgotten in this community, but not completely because the black people of this community still have to live in the shadow of this study. Um, as you can see here, there is a street and a park named after him. And though it has been bulldozed for years, there was a school that stood in this community that was named after this superintendent. One of the enduring impacts of Rushton and Tanzer's work is that Black students across Ontario have their intelligence undermined by a phenomenon known as academic streaming. So before I came to Western, I was a student in the Toronto District School Board. So there was the streaming program, which I think is all over Ontario. It started as locally developed, applied learning, and then academic learning, where academic be at the highest. So going into high school, I was streamed into applied courses, and I didn't realize that the, those were the courses that were that I was going to take, and my parents weren't consulted. So it was only after I started classes that I figured there were different streams, and if I had been in academic, I would have more options. I started facing challenges in my uh, my second year of high school, grade ten. I wanted to be a pilot. I told my guidance class, I'm like, I want to be a pilot. Also, when I, when I was young, I just wanted to be a pilot. And they're like, okay, we'll see what we can do for you. They said, oh, I think college would be good for you. Uh, because at the time, it was either college, you know, no, university, college, and then trading. I ended up going to my guidance counselor to, uh, to switch and to take more challenging courses because I knew I wanted to, t to go into university after I graduated and I wanted to have that option available to me. They didn't really encourage me to follow those courses to be a pilot. The only thing that they gave me all these gym classes and like things that are basic, that would not, not be enough for me to get into university or college to be a pilot. I have one friend who I always thought was so smart. We had very similar classes together, but when it was time for picking um, a university or a college level course, the guidance counselor advised that my friend take a college level course while I was taking the university course. She was excelling in ways that I thought I could never do, even though I was in a higher course. And I kept telling her, you should be taking these university level courses. You shouldn't be in this class. Like you're getting like 100% and everything like that. But there was no one there to advocate for her. Advocating for myself at the time was very important uh, because I wanted to make sure that I could, I could essentially have a say in my future. I finished high school. I, I applied to a bunch of schools uh, into like aviation mechanics, but when I attended those classes, I felt the difficulties because I wasn't prepared enough in high school. When I spoke to my profs in college, I'm like, what kind of math I needed? They're like, oh, you need this kind of math? I'm like, well, I didn't take that kind of math. In summer of 2020, Canadians joined global protests following the murder of George Floyd. In Chatham, two sisters joined a protest and shared their experiences of what unfolded when they returned to school. There was this kid that would always come to, up to me and kneel on the ground, do the Black Lives Matter fist and say, all lives matter. And then another thing that happened, I was in class and these two kids were fighting 
and he said, watch out or I'll pull a George Floyd on you. The same day this stuff happened to Amelia, um, this white boy during recess, he was running up to people and hitting them with the stick. But then at a certain point, he was only hitting me with the stick. Um, he ran up to me about three times and um, he was whacking me with it while saying slavery 2021 and um, I'd buy you for $400 an hour get me a cotton sweater, yeah. And um, yeah, I, um, I had some marks on my chest and he was also saying, I'm gonna whip you like your ancestors were whipped. After everything had started, um, my mom had contacted the principal and they talked to the class, but they mentioned nothing about racism. They just said that we need to be good to each other um, and it made no impact on everybody. Everybody thought it was a joke. So when we got home, after they talked to both of our classes, people were threatening us online. They were saying that we shouldn't have got certain people in trouble. They didn't do anything. We didn't have a reason and that we were being dramatic. And that made me feel really unprotected by the school board and the school because they should have handled it in a better way instead of us needing to wait so long for it to actually be handled in a good matter. Not only are black students not protected at school, many parents express that criminalizing their children starts early, as one London mother recounts. thinking that they are going to be what? Protected and be safe. But because they are born in this skin color, they've already been put into a pot, and the pot is already boiling. From the moment my son entered school from the age of five, there's already a system in place to say he is disruptive. He is, he is, and not understanding who he is because of the system that's put in place. So when he was in grade eight and a teacher's cell phone went missing, so they said, the only child that they blamed was this black boy who doesn't have anything to say that he is like this, but because of the color of his skin, it must be him. They did every kind of thing to coerce him to say something that he didn't do. He knew he didn't do it and he was vindicated. But how many of our young black youth have that opportunity to do that? I went to a school where there weren't many black kids like me. One occasion where there was a fight about to happen on the playground. Again, this is between the, the grade two to five periods, so very young. A fight that I saw was about to happen on the playground. So because I was so used to being suspended all of the time, I decided, you know what, today was the day I felt like I'm not, I don't feel like being suspended. So I purposefully went to the other end of the playground, and it was a large playground. So now I'm out of sight, not even in the vicinity, and the bell rang. We went into to the school for the day, and then afterwards, around lunchtime, I was called to the office. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I know for sure, for sure, that I did not do anything. There's no reason for me to be called to the office. and. The little boy, he looks like he was crying, and I'm sitting there and I'm wondering, what's, what's this all about? What does this have to do with me? And she says to me, I know you were involved with what happened on the playground, and I know you were involved with bullying this little boy. And I said, no ma'am, I was, I was not involved, I was not even around, I don't even know what happened. And she said, Yes, you were, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna tell me what you did. And if you don't tell me what you did, I'm going to expel you. So this went on for probably about 15 to 20 minutes with her coercing me to tell her, to incriminate myself, to tell her something that I did that I was not involved with doing. Eventually, I got scared that she was really going to expel me as she was threatening uh, to do. 
So I started to make up things about myself. I started to say, okay, uh, you know, I think I, I hit the boy. And the little boy, he screamed out and he said, no, that's not all he did. So now he's lying on me. And she says to him, don't worry, it's okay. I'm gonna get down to the bottom of this. And she slams her hand down on the desk and she says, you better tell me what you did right now and tell me the full thing or else I'm going to expel you. So I'm crying and I'm trying to think in my head, what's like, I don't, cause I didn't, I really didn't do anything. So what did he tell her? So I'm trying to think, what did he tell her? And he's a little white boy, I'm a black boy. What did he tell her? She's a white principal that, you know, I need to say in order for her to not expel me because she's gonna think that I'm lying. This, this kind of kept going on, kept going on, and I couldn't think of what to say. All I could say is, well, I was bullying him, I think I hit him, I wasn't sure. She eventually picked me up by the collar of my shirt and she said, that's it, that's it. And she, as she picked me up, I started to say, no, 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 please, 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 because I thought that she meant that's it, she's gonna expel me. She picked me up by the collar of my shirt behind me, behind, behind my shirt, and she took me into this um, room in the office where they had a photocopying machine and they kept their papers and different storages and she put me in the room and she said I'm going to leave you in this room and you're going to think about what you did and when I come back you better tell me what you did and she slammed the door now she didn't turn on the light so I was in this room by myself and it was dark and I remember just it, it felt like it was hours that I was in there and I remember thinking to myself why am I going through this and why am I always the one that I feel like I'm always the one that's being wrongly, um, wrongly convicted of things, you know, and being suspended and expelled and different things like that. And I remember I said a little prayer because I grew up as a, I grew up a Christian and I said a little prayer and I said, you know, God, just help me in this moment because I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to say. And when she opens the door, I'm just going to say everything that I practiced and rehearsed in that little um, storage room that she put me in. And I'm just going to tell her, you can do whatever you want to do to me, but all I know is that I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. And when the door opened up and the light from the rest of the office came into this dark room, I remember just starting to say, Okay, and I started, 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 started to just speak and she stopped me and she said, stop, it's okay. I found out what really happened and I realized that you actually didn't do anything. So I said, oh, okay. One policy that had the adverse effect of criminalizing black students was the Ontario Safe Schools Act. From the early 1990s, um, the Mike Harris government instituted the Safe Streets Act, and in the 2000s, we saw the, the Safe Schools Act. Um, the, the philosophy behind it was to curb any kind of violence within our streets and within schools. What we found out was that in terms of suspension rates and expulsion rates, Black Canadians, African Canadians, were overrepresented to a disproportionate amount, as well as Black Canadians with disabilities, too. Alex Baddock is a Toronto-based education lawyer who provides expert guidance to Ontario's academic institutions. There are many reasons why Ontario's Black youth may wind up in the youth criminal justice system, and many of these re reasons relate to social, economic, or political factors that are working against young black people. And these are very palpable impacts on a student's long-term success or life trajectory. And what we know about students who encounter student discipline often or miss school too often is they have a higher likelihood of ending up in the youth criminal justice system for many different reasons, such as not necessarily being engaged in school, uh, being subject to uh, labeling and stereotyping and being the victims of bias as a result of things like that. So these are different ways in which um, the school system has made it difficult for students to succeed. I do have a lot of friends who, uh, unfortunately, they dropped out of school 
they would say things like school is bullshit school is you don't need to be to have school to be successful in life and i'll ask them why you say that man they'll be like man this teacher says this that's this and those are the the issues that most of them they would tell me man i don't think i want to i want to move forward i want to drop out of school they ended up in, in trouble with the police with the law and that's when things go down in the wrong path we're dealing with the very real situation of this school prison pipeline which my son is a victim of my son's in, in jail right now and his war started in school it's not that education is unimportant to us, but we realize very quickly that the education system is not meant to, to uh, help our children to be as successful as they can, and it shows in the numbers. Mm. The numbers of kids that are not graduating, the number of kids that go straight from school to, to prison. having been born in, in South Africa, and so having been born into this anti-apartheid struggle, you know, my relationship with education is a very politicized one because that was one of the um, major objectives of, of apartheid was to make sure that we, as the African indigenous majority, you know, were not educated and that would allow them then to be able to, you know, program us, control us, etc. which, you know, look at South Africa today. It's almost like you, 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 you literally learn to have to put on this armor when you go to school as a parent and as a child, you know, because 101 very questionable things could happen to your child in the space of a school day. Young people that had experienced challenges and that were involved in the justice system, they often reflected on a mentor, um, whether it was a, a peer, someone that was a little bit older, um, somebody that had gone through the, the justice system as well and understood some of the, the nuances and, and really what would be helpful around services and supports. To have somebody like that in their life was very critical in them being able to lean on them when they needed to, get that advice, get those resources, and move forward. So my experience with educating kids who, are being, who have been in the system and are now reintegrating back into high school, it's been a challenging experience, but also a rewarding experience. What I realized uh, teaching uh, students who are coming back into the system is that they need a level of motivation. They've been institutionalized for so long and being within the system and being in jail, uh, coming out of jail and into a school setting for a lot of them is a new experience and uh, it's hard for them to reintegrate. So the unique things about organizations is that they take a cultural lens. They're coming from the community and so they recognize what it is that um, the black community needs. Love Music Initiative is an organization that takes on an alternative um, approach to education. They have built some really strong relationships um, in schools where they have gone into schools and they have used different elements of the arts um, to connect with the students. I'm an arts-based educator, I'm a parent, I'm a husband, I'm a father of three boys, and been working in the not-for-profit sector for over 20 years. So that music initiative is really focused on offering uh, culturally responsive and sensitive programming. What we do is arts-based educational workshops in community settings, corporate, as well as school settings. We do DJ workshops, drumming, dance, and spoken word. Youth do not see themselves within the curriculum. They do not see themselves reflected um, with the people that are teaching them. Culturally relevant pedagogy is so important in this work because a lot of the kids need to know that their experience matters within the education system and that what they've experienced is also important and a part of the learning process. So culturally relevant pedagogy, what it does for the kids is has them feel that they are a part of the curriculum and that their stories matter. 
We had a number of conversations with uh, young people that were students that were also involved within the child welfare system. Uh, one thing that they they spoke about quite candidly was that, you know, there was a lot of things going on in their life. And so often it was hard for them to get to school, go into the classroom, sit down and think about the test that was in front of them when, you know, they were facing real external challenges. They spoke about issues around food security, um, around mental health and wellness, um, knowing that they wanted to um, talk to somebody about some of the things that they were going through and not knowing where to start. Um, even simple things like, how do I get to school when I don't have the funds and I don't have a bus pass? For many decades, uh, many generations, Black families and Black community has been speaking about what child welfare is doing to us as a community, um, is doing to our children, and how it has separated our families and the impact it has on us. And for a very long time, child welfare has not been listening. Families, because of their identities, because they were black, because they were possibly Jamaican or other parts of the Caribbean or black generations Canadian, were not having the same outcomes. They weren't experiencing the same. So files would be open because they were black. Files would stay open longer uh, children would languish in care because kin was not considered. A lot of times these young, these young people end up into, into group homes, uh, again, not able to understand, you know, the trauma that black children um, experience coming into care. And so when a young person acts out in the group home setting, a group care setting, which is foreign to the identity of who we are as a people, of course they're going to be acting out. And what is the recourse when you act out? Is to call the police. And I dare say, you know, talk to many of those young people who are in our system. You know, child welfare is, is one of those portals that's led to young people being in the youth justice because they're in a group home, they act out, and the only recourse a lot of these workers have um, is to call the police. So for the longest time, I mean, over 50 years, black people in Ontario had been lobbying, trying to address the overrepresentation of black families in child welfare and the overrepresentation of black children in care and the outcomes for black children wasn't the same. Finally, in about 2013, the Toronto CS released their stats. So I say it's interesting because we always knew, we had the anecdotes, we knew what was going on, but at the same time, we didn't have the numbers. The ministry had to kind of take note and they funded a program which eventually was called One Vision, One Voice. And they're there to help us with in-child welfare, basically um, address the inequities. One of the things that uh, a lot of uh, individuals spoke about in the focus group was just how generations are affected through the school to prison pipeline. One example of that is where parents find themselves having to go into a system that they actually also faced oppression in as a, as a young person, as a student going through the system as well. Uh, oftentimes we don't even realize as parents that it's triggering. You know, we, we might be facing a situation where we as a parent need to go in and advocate or maybe we need to navigate the, the system to find resources for our child and when we enter those doors we're, we're feeling triggered and sometimes we as parents don't even necessarily realize why. For myself being a single black mother having children within the system it's not easy but it's not surprising. Why? I've seen my parents go through that with my brothers and to think that over the past 40 years or so it has not changed but indeed it has worsened it is, it's frightening. You get a phone call from the school your heart races because you're like, oh my goodness, what's, what's going on? And it shouldn't be that way. But once again, the system is not there to help. They tell you your child is this, which is negative. They tell your child is that, which is negative. And if they're telling you the parent, how much are they doing that to the child that's in their environment? I, I've raised my daughters to know how beautiful they are and that they can be anything they want to be. And when the school didn't help my children during that period for the two weeks, it was like every day. It got worse and it got worse and it got worse. And 
I had to call the school daily and fight for my kids, and it was something that I wasn't going to give up on. My mom always explained to me that, you know what, the one thing that I don't want to do is make life more difficult for you. And unfortunately, this is the school that is closest to us, and this is the school that works right now. But the school only went up to a certain grade. It went up to grade five. And she said, you know, after grade five, we'll go somewhere else. So I, let's just do what we need to do to survive. And I hated that, and I, and I still hate that, that feeling that as a, a black man, as a black child, as a, as a black woman, as a black anything, that you need to always navigate the world with this idea that I just need to be able to survive. You know, as a black father, like I definitely have moments where I feel a little bit anxious. Um, I feel nervous because I know that them going into certain environments, they may be the only black child or they may be one of only a few black children that are in a certain space and naturally my concern is that um, are they being treated well, are they being treated fairly and a lot of times their voice and them being in a space they're not really being considered and so as a black parent uh, and black father and also as a community activist seeing so many things happen in community for um, our young people you know, I'm always big on advocating, like advocating for my boys and them advocating for themselves and being confident to advocate for themselves. Someone in the classroom called my child the N-word and the administrator of the school asked me what the big deal is. He didn't understand what the problem was. I have a big problem with it because it's a derogatory term and it's not her name. The more we call these children out of their name, the more trauma they're experiencing. We can't assume that every family thinks that it's okay to take this word back and claim it as our own and, and, and call each other the N-word. For me, when I think of the N-word, it's not a word that we use in my house. It's not a word that I grew up using. I will never use that word against another person. To me, it's, it's violence. And it reminds me of a kid growing up and watching Roots as a family and lynchings. So when I think of that word and I think about growing up, um, especially in the 70s, where that you heard that word all the time, it was violence. So I'm not one for let's take it as a term of endearment and let's take the power away from it. No, the power you take away by not using it against each other because to me, that's when the oppressor has won, is when you have internalized that and you can, I understand the arguments for the use of it, I disagree. I respectfully disagree with that. And it's really important for schools to work closely with organizations because they're the ones that are providing direct supports to young people, to their parents. And so we have organizations like Family Fuse um, out in Windsor that um, works co very closely with the parents' advisory. They get firsthand um, accounts of what the parents' needs are and also um, how they can best support the parents. For decades, Black families in Windsor and Essex County have been facing disparity in the education system. We're facing problems with distreaming, with over-policing in the schools, with um, mass suspensions and expulsions, as well as uh, microaggressions in the classrooms, which create toxic environments for our students and our youth, and which makes our parents have difficulty in um, participating in their children's education. That leads to a child not even wanting to go to school, right, because they don't feel a sense of belonging. They feel like they're targeted. And in addition to that, um, feeling targeted, you know, that makes me as a parent have a harder time parenting my child because when you believe in education and you're in a society which thrives on people being educated, um, it just becomes that much more challenging to even get your child out of bed. We support black parents, guardians, and caregivers through the education system to help their, um, their children. There's also free workshops as well as free one-on-one -on -one coaching, amongst many other things, to assist these parents that are suffering in the school system um, by not being able to understand why their children have been targeted.
What does it mean to create our future? And what does it mean for our community to be involved in that process? A Dinkra Farm is a concept that was created by my husband and his band called Truths and Rights, which was a reggae band that existed in Toronto in the 70s. One of the things that they dreamed about was having a place like a Dinkra Farm, where it was a community place, a safe space for community, farming could happen here, as well as all of the things that it takes to be a liberated people. At Adinkra Farm, one of the conversations that comes up regularly is this concept of the school to prison pipeline. So we talk about, are we having a, an appropriate reaction as a community to that? Many times we have our programming here, which includes our summer camps, March break camps. We do retreats for young people and so on. And many times, young people who have interacted with the justice system find a safe place here at Adinkra Farm. But we struggle with understanding why so many of our young people are having that experience. So many of our young people are having the experience of losing someone in their, in their life to either uh, prison Mm -hmm. Right, or to death, like you know, on the street. This place is this is like a gold mine for healing, for helping our young people think differently. Because I think that's a big part of also who we are. We we think differently. We learn differently. Mm -hmm. You know, as African people, we come from very different ways of being, and so for us. So learning for us isn't just sitting in a classroom and looking at a teacher. It's being out in nature. It's actively engaging, learning how to do things, make things with your hands. That's what learning is because our elders, you know, taught us that you already have everything already inside you. We should be building um, our resources from the bottom upwards to support family. And so part of the work that we're doing is that we've centered black family and the voice of the black family and the voice of the child in the work that we do in a way that has never done before. We understand that this speaks to the unity of the family and that is important to us as a black community to preserve our family. And so when workers or anyone engaging our community, knowing that Family is important to us as a black community, and what are you going to do to support us to keep our families together? We can change all the policies when we want to change, but it really comes down to changing a mindset, changing how people really think, because we've seen historically where we've changed laws. You know, there wasn't supposed to be segregation so well. We'll just change the law, but people are still being treated the same way. People still can't get housing because of the color of their skin. Until you kind of reach in, and so I, I'm fortunate that I get to do training, and try to coach people until you kind of reach into who they are. You really need to shake them up because we're talking about hundreds of years of colonization. We're talking about oppression that is so systemic and to the point where it's, it's the air that people breathe. So how they walk in the world, what they see on TV, what they read, what they're exposed to, even in the education system, we're still having issues that until we can really change so that people can be in a situation and not need a policy, to tell them this is oppressive. Some useful policies and things to consider to reverse the trends that we see in terms of the school to prison pipeline really have a lot to do with school itself. One of the biggest barriers for students who want to succeed is if they are suspended or expelled at a certain point, and especially if this becomes more frequent, it actually can be demonstrated through research that you're more likely to not graduate, for instance. When we're talking about policy changes, I think we should necessarily visit the idea of student discipline. What does that mean? What does it mean to discipline a student? And what does it mean to uh, ensure that they are uh, being meaningful members of society and contributing actively to, to society? So the unique things about organizations is that they take a cultural lens. They're coming from the community, and so they recognize what it is that um, the Black community needs. 
It's vitally important that this Black Community Centre is here in London, Ontario to help the youth to be motivated with the workshops we have, with the counselling sessions we have, with different activities that we have and will continue to have. And one of the projects that we have recently started, which has launched, is London's first Black Public Library. And within that library is exactly it, authors that look like you and me. When I was born here in Canada I did, and I went to school, I had no books that looked like me. And so out of mind, out of sight, you don't feel valued. You didn't want to be black because you didn't see anything of value that was looking like you in books, doctors, lawyers, nothing that looked like you that you wanted to what? P be presented and be pushed and motivated to become better. And so this Black Community Centre opened up the Black Library to motivate, to empower, to let people know that we are valued and that we do have a place that we belong. <laughs> From what you've seen is a group of uh, young men. We had guys from Uganda, Sudan. <laughs> Our main goal is to help uh, young African men to integrate into Canadian uh, society. And most of them are in high school. And when I ask them, why are you, why are you here? Because they're like, oh man, this is one of the best thing I want to do during the week. Because we see each other, we talk, um, we speak Swahili, uh, English, Uganda. Uh, if you know one person that speaks your language, you're gonna talk to them in your language. We're at school, some of them go to school with their only them that speak their own language. So when you're there, you're expressing yourself. Talk about life, talk about soccer, and we do travel, which is the best part. Travel within Ontario, even in Quebec, within Canada as well. Uh, we've been in Ottawa twice now. So our trip to Ottawa today was not just about soccer. Uh, it was about learning uh, about the Canadian culture, the history behind uh, what created this beautiful country. And unfortunately, there's a dark history behind it. And uh, it's the residential schools. And as we're looking at here, um, the kids that are, these mass barriers, they've been found in Canada, all across Canada. Yeah, we came here to play soccer, but we're also learning other things besides soccer and, you know, the respect, paying the respect is very important for us as a team. This is important for us because most of the kids that we have, the first time they come to Canada, they, it's London. So when we say we're going to Ottawa, they're very, very excited. We teach them, so now most of them know. If they see an orange flag says, all kids matter, they know that, oh yeah, it's because that happened. And in Ottawa, we've made uh, friends there. Some of them know that if I go to Ottawa and I call this person, I could have a place to stay. We are a mentorship program for black youth in London. So the program is run by us, the three of us, black youth for black youth. And our goal is to provide Black youth in London with a network, support, and resources to thrive academically and in their personal growth. A few years ago, a group of my friends and I started an initiative called Black Youth Connect. It's a space that provides Black youth with um, a community of peers, professionals, and leaders. We started the initiative because of our own experiences of being streamed and having to advocate for ourselves. We wanted to use those experiences to ensure that the youth we were working with have the resources and the information they need about their academic experiences and also about um, potential career opportunities they could pursue by connecting them to professionals who look like them. Being part of this process has been incredibly fulfilling, knowing that the youth we work with can come to us and we can provide them with the resources and the information we, uh, they need uh, using our own experiences. And also, 
connecting them with people who advocate for students within the school system. I think the combination of those factors have allowed a lot of the, the black youth that we work with to have the agency to have a say in their future. To give a shout out to my other uh, interns, Crystal and Nye Keck, with their beautiful talents, able to work alongside our mentors, George Johnson, Gloria, and Sasina. I would say there are a lot of challenges that come with being a black youth in London, Ontario. One of them being isolation. And that's something that I struggled with for a long time. Whenever you go to schools, a majority of them are white, you know, as a majority. And so it's very hard to find friends that kind of share your skin color, that look like you, that might share your culture, share your food. And it's hard to connect with other people because they all have their own cultures and experiences that they normally go through that you just won't understand. There you go, much better. As you guys know, Chef JP and his crew over there just finished the food. Just let you guys go. We got vegan, we got halal, and we got burgers and hot dogs. Black Youth Connect means it's akin to a tree, actually. Black Youth Connect reminds me of a tree because for a long time I thought that I was a fallen branch like that one over there. I'd fallen from, you know, the big branches of this big tree and I couldn't really connect myself. And so Black Youth Connect was kind of just reattaching me to that tree. It allowed me to connect with people that had my experiences, shared my culture, people that looked like me, spoke like me, maybe came from the same countries as me, as me you know? And I was able to share stories with people and they would understand it. Stories about either my African bringing up, African parents, you know, the food. It was very enlightening. It allowed me to kind of feel happier about things. Made me feel like I was part of something bigger than myself. And I was actually connected in a community that cared about me and was like me.